Um, in case you haven't heard, uh, this year is the CPOA, the Chautauqua Property Owners Association's 60th anniversary. And in preparation two years ago, Johanna Shoulder and I uh, began delving into all of the CPOA history, the files that have been collected over the years that happened to be in the archives. Uh, she reviewed the documents and then went into review the Chautauqua daily records to sub substantiate some of those documents. We actually do have a mic. It's right here. Oh. Make sure it's okay. on. Yeah. Can you hear me better now? No? Can you hear me better now? Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so for Johanna, this history became her mission. It's her passion, and which you're going to see here when you see this slideshow. She reviewed the documents that were in the archives and then went on to review the Chautauqua daily records to substantiate or supplement what was available in the CPOA records. And then she began to add some color with these lovely um, photos that she found also in the Chautauqua archives. We also reached out to past CPOA presidents and we received seven responses, starting in 1984 with Lou Weinman. And if you'd like to take a look at any of those, they're here on the trifold. They sent basically an, an account of their memories of being um, president at that time and what was going on with the property owners and the institution and the CPOA. Um, Johanna is a longtime Chautauqua homeowner, and currently she's the CPOA Area 5 representative, a board member. Johanna will talk us through the history of property ownership and the CPOA. Thank you, Erica. And yes, we brought not only the trifold, which uh, indicates a timeline that we're trying to keep it. That's just relates to CPOA and the last 60 years. And then the uh, documents that are actually on the chairs, at the top of the chairs, I brought those because those are examples of what is in the file. We have several files that the archivist, uh, John uh, Schmidt, told us to take with us and keep at the CPOA office. And so we did. And there's quite a few old, uh, interesting articles, and then there's a lot of um, the letters and uh, newsletters that went out to homeowners from uh, the CPOA president and also very early homeowner or cottage owner meetings. And those are, some of them are copies and some of them are the real documents. But just to prove that I'm not banking this up. So, um, but I'll tell you one thing, after a couple of years of reading these uh, articles, um, it could be a very dry and boring <laughs> report. So I'm trying to make it a little more interesting and tell this as basically the story of, of ownership. And I'm sure there's a lot more to it, and many of you could contribute to it. But um, thanks again, Erica. And uh, again, my name's Johanna Shoulder. I'm the chair of the CPOA History Committee. I do enjoy reading Chautauqua history and was always curious about how this Victorian encampment evolved and why people bought summer homes here. Last summer, Erica and I found a few files at the archives relating to property owners. I believe I read over 300 pages of articles that fill the file I took home with me. It's an odd assortment of collected papers. I read the papers that start in 1876 and go to 1996. Many years and decades are missing. We were curious about what was behind the formation of the CPOA and when did it start. We felt also the organization's accomplishments and challenges should be documented as uh, we talked about and we did that and put it in a timeline. With my 27 years of summering here, many of those years volunteering on boards as a community member, I am convinced that homeowners and leaseholders held sway over the shape of Chautauqua. It was my personal goal to gain a better understanding of the unique role property owners have had here and as a member of the corporation. As a corporation, 
the Chautauqua Corporation runs like a business but lives as a community. It has an interrelated dependency between the members of the corporation and its governance. The governance being the board of trustees. One can't do well without the other. This is the history of the CPOA, but to understand the formation of its mission, I need to take you back to the early days of being a leaseholder. We all know Lewis Miller and John Heil Benson were the dynamic leaders and visionaries founding Chautauqua. Early on, they incorporated the assembly and established a board of trustees. The trustees oversaw the finances, legalities, land acquisition, rules, and policy for this religious summer school camp. When you came to this camp in the 1880s and you liked it and wanted to stay and participate, you had to follow the rules and policy of this assembly. They owned all this land, uh, like many of the camps around the lake. When you didn't want to rent a tent anymore and wanted to build your own cottage, you leased one of the lots that is going to be built on. There were rules of civility that you signed your lease with, like no alcohol on the premise and where you could put your wastewater from your house. You even had to make sure everyone in your household had a ticket or a pass to be on the grounds. The programs were so impressive. From 6 a.m. till vespers, there were activities for everyone to participate in, even a newspaper announcing your arrival. There you are. That is truly the dock and one of the steamships. And people arrived with those great big um, trunks. So there were an assortment of cool photos like this. And in the front, those crates are full of vegetables and uh, fruits. So <clears throat> all of uh, the um, cottagers, boarding house, and hotel owners were really vested in this amazing place. And they let the leadership know about it at their corporation meetings. All of the board members, and there were 24 of them, were all elected by leaseholders. Everyone who leased their property from the assembly, and they all had something to say. Thousands of visitors came and rented rooms and tents, but it was the people who owned the summer places on the grounds who elected among themselves the trustees to make the decisions. Everything from policy to infrastructure, from gate tickets to quiet hours, from clean drinking water to driving your horses too fast. The members of the corporation elected all of the trustees to the board. Those who attended the corporation meetings were very influential in the ongoings of Chautauqua. After a while though, this board of trustees didn't work very well. Miller and Vincent couldn't get a darn thing done. The board became inefficient for many good reasons. Like the leaseholders needed a quorum at their meetings to nominate and vote for their trustee of choice. We know the leaseholders had a meager showing in the 1880s and 90s. I also read about infighting between cottagers and the big boarding house owners. The makeup of the board represented that divide. I read examples of what I would call bickering. So like, you know, they would bicker about boarding house owners wanted to have more Coney Island type features and cottagers did. Cottagers <coughs> got the same vote, a single a cottage owner got the same vote as a single boarding house owner. Well, a boarding house had hundreds of people staying at maybe their their place and they owned several lots. They only got one vote. So um, there was a problem with them not showing up and it was very biased at the, the formation of these board meetings and 
self-electing occurred to fill many of these em empty trustee spots. Our great leaders wanted to see their popular, idyllic summer retreat continue to expand and not be bogged down by, struggling, by a struggling board. So they revised the charter. It's 1902. We still have 24 members of the Board of Trustees, but 20 of these talented folks are now self-appointed and four are elected by the corporation, the leaseholders. We can talk about the revised charter and what it accomplished later if you have questions because it, there's quite a few things that it did accomplish but uh, I won't bring it here. Um, Chautauqua grew and grew. It's 1926 now. Where are we? You recognize where we are in that field? Yeah, that's right. They're watching a not softball, baseball, great. It, it's a, it was a big deal, a lot of baseball photos. To say nothing about the cars, there was 600 cottages, boarding, and rooming houses, and lots of these cars. The article also mentions that the Chautauqua Hotel Company has recently built a fine addition of 50 rooms each, equipped with bath. The institution is drawing a national name for itself with important people coming to lecture and teach. And don't forget the music, the John Philip Sousa Band just drew the largest crowds since Teddy Roosevelt's visit in 1905. There we go, I got a photo of Teddy Roosevelt right there in the, car, in the uh, carriage. But I couldn't find one of the John Philip Sousa Band. So the Board of Trustees, President and Administrator, were industriously adding new buildings and programs. And the corporation members continued to do what they were very good at. They were the ears and eyes on the grounds. They shared what worked and what didn't, what didn't with the trustees at the cottage holders meetings. The members were updated on the institution status and cottagers gave suggestions on how to make the Chautauqua on the grounds experience better for participants. A little aside here, the term representative was commonly used in written reports to refer to a class B trustee. Remember, class B trust, uh, trustee is equal to the elected trustee. I quote a 1932 newsletter in the file. Mrs. Mina Edison was informed of her unanimous re-election as trustee representing cottage owners. And another quote from 1948 Daily, the board was officially informed of the election of Mrs. L. A. Byerly, owner of the Cary Hotel, by the cottage holders to be representative of the property holders to the board. So from the beginning, we have the expectation of cottagers to be actively contributing to the betterment of the Chautauqua experience. Despite having less representation on the board, leaseholders had four identifiable voices on the board. Cottagers continue to give the utmost attention to the physical attraction on the grounds and the needs of residents. They had a strong vested interest in making sure that Chautauqua continued to prosper and do well. This may mean renting rooms out of their home, following rules and regulations, and supporting the annual fund or some sort of philanthropy. 1936 brought empowerment to the homeowner in response to last minute fundraising to save the institution from bankruptcy. Homeowners were encouraged to buy the deed of their home and become property owner. Samuel Hazlett was instrumental in raising enough funds from property owners and others to save the institution from bankruptcy. In response to owners' support, the institution bylaws were changed to require the majority of board members be property owners. The community's identity was strengthened by the struggle to pull the institution out of debt. For the next three decades, 
Chautauqua was a sleepy, club-like community. Houses were painted white. Gate tickets, gate ticket numbers slowly spiraled down as large boarding houses and hotels. That's boarding house. What's it? Which one is it? Albion. Albion. What is it now? It was probably apartments and condos. All right. And hotels were replaced also. This was the Box Hotel on Simpson. A long time ago, it did burn down. But it was replaced with a single family home. So leading up to 1963, when the idea of the CPOA was first conceived, Chautauqua was a pretty tight Protestant community. They didn't like to see a lot of change. It was a favorable time to organize. The Chautauqua Daily states, the Chautauqua Property Owner Association met on July 2nd, 1963 at McKnight Hall with a crowd of 250 people. Their purpose was to establish better communication between the institution and the property owners. Their policy statement submitted to the Daily two weeks later states the following. This organization is formed to establish and maintain the best possible relations between Chautauqua Institution and the property owners of Chautauqua. Residents' complaints, many but minor, could now be channeled through this new association and be taken directly to the institution's uh, president. His name was Curtis Howe, and he was new. All he asked was for residents to consolidate their issues or suggestions and have the CPOA president bring the list to him at the end of the summer. The earliest letter with a list found in our file is from 1968, addressed to President Howe. This letter written by Mrs. Haller, our president then, has 22, 21 items of concern that could be addressed by the administration. I share a few uh, on the list here with you. The fine, loose gravel that is used as street topping is most annoying, being slippery and dusty. Could that be eliminated or proved upon? Number two, North Shore residents still wish to have tree tops clipped so they may see our lovely bell tower. This courtesy used to be extended, and I see nothing unreasonable in asking for it again. Number three, would a Volkswagen parking lot help to solve the space problem for cars? Figure that one out. So, Dr. Howe would address each item in a letter sent back in the spring, explaining action or inaction. All improvements suggested by residents were noted in CPOA meeting updates. A few in the 1969 update were outside lighting improvements, evergreens were planted to cover unsightly areas, drain lines were installed for better drainage at the bottom of Miller Park, the benches in the amphitheater were repaired, the Jane Avenue dock was enlarged, better signing Announce, a signage announcing program events installed at the main gate. Also found in the file are reports of the Board of Trustee meetings written by the elected trustees and sent out to corporation members. These trustee reports gave updates on the proceedings of the recent board meetings. Being informed of finances, planning, and management contributed to a strong sense of stewardship palpable in many of these CPOA newsletters. I note a few stats from 1968. Um, gate ticket reports, attendance at the end of the summer was a little over 56,000. The largest registration in the history of Boys and Girls Club was reported this year. The cost of a season pass was $60. The 
institution hires two more administrators with the result of the institution now having five administrative officers. As I sift through the files, I eventually came up with 21 Class B reports written on and off between 1968 and 1990. The 1970s were a very busy time with CPOA. It, it established itself as a primary communicator with the administration. The area reps fostered porch gatherings, discussed things like condo development on the grounds, dog walking and parking enforcement. Feedback on the bus was fast and furious. The CPOA became the primary communicator on local government issues as well. It sends letters out to all owners to advise and raise awareness on everything from garbage pickup to the upcoming countywide reassessments. From their advocacy, wastewater, sewage treatment, and utility infrastructure was upgraded. The community is growing with more homes and visitors. CPOA makes sure a new, bigger water storage tank is installed after getting approval with the Board of Trustees. It's 1972, institution president Oscar Remick, there he is, and chairman of the board, Richard Miller, there he is too, are, they're really shaking up the establishment, the establishment. We are heavily in debt. The institution is more than $600,000 in debt. Now, paying off debt meant attracting new levels of endowments. What's important here is they set out to heighten the image of Chautauqua and appeal to a wider constituency. Lots of big decisions make the big decisions from, uh, going on and uh, Owners wanted to be informed on the future of Chautauqua and how any chain may, change may affect them. Leadership says big changes are needed to catapult Chautauqua forward and bring in new funding sources. As the years went on, three issues were brought up most frequently by residents. Lack of communication between owners and the Board of Trustees, vehicular transportation problems, and how expensive having a summer place in Chautauqua was getting. These issues, along with others, are familiar 50, 50 years later. They just wax and wane, two step forwards, one step back. Now it is the bicentennial summer, and CPOA President George Follinsby, with the guidance of Richard Miller, set up a liaison committee to actively improve listening to homeowners' concerns. This committee is made up of Class B trustees and active CPOA members. They saw to it that roads once again are repaired, safety and security improved, and education on amphitheater etiquette visible. I quote the committee chair speaking at a property owner meeting early in the summer. There have been no real miracles performed. Parking traffic are at the top of the list, and that may take several years and a lot of money. He states that on the matter of dogs running free, property owners may want to provide for a full or part-time dog warden. The security officers do not have time for this extra duty. A lot of, a lot of unleashed dogs back for the day. By 1979, relations had improved. A quote from the June uh, 30th, 1979, Chautauqua Daily says, property owners are urged to visit their CPOA representatives to voice their concerns and put those concerns in writing. From property owner to area representative to liaison committee to administration. It's a chain that works. For a membership of $2, you will be supporting a group which consistently works to improve, extend, and advance the interests of all Chautauquas. CPOA designates a committee on taxes to explore tax reduction, school consolidation, and possible legislative action. The association also hired an attorney to review a possible class action suit 
against the town of Chautauqua for double taxing. In August of 1981, CPOA made a motion at their meeting that we, the property owners of Chautauqua Institution, hereby affirm our determination to seek relief from excessive taxation by securing counsel and filing class action proceedings against Chautauqua County and the town of Chautauqua, or in the event that this action should fail for any reason, suitable steps be taken to secede from the town of Chautauqua and form a separate municipality. Well, taxes were really a big deal for decades. In 1981, um, also the uh, property owner association, they mailed out a survey with satisfaction um, about the institution to all property owners on record. 690 private properties. There was a 51% return. Our association president, Ralph Crockett, shared these results with the board of trustees at an open forum in Smith Wilkes Hall. 75% of respondents spend the full season on the grounds. 63% regard the symphony orchestra as their primary interest here. And most feel that Chautauqua's major buildings and grounds are satisfactory, except for the unpleasant looking welcome gate. I thought, what? Welcome gate, okay. And most feeling that there is a housing shortage on the grounds. If only, this is a comment, one of the hundreds of comments, if only there were more apartments, program attendance could be improved. The survey also asks, what, are you, what areas of physical improvement are the most important to you? Roads was the top response. The survey was thick with voluntary comments. The opinion range was wide. Within time, you know, various condominiums were built. And the main gate was spruced up with flowering plants and baskets. Examples of big and little actions that voices are heard. We relay to leadership what works and what doesn't. Now, many of the um, survey comments also are critical of the institution. Um, from one generation to the next, you can press the repeat button. Policy, rules, and regulations are added or amended, and things improve for a while, but then the problems come back. It's the nature of a busy summer cultural retreat with narrow streets and a thousand people colliding with each new administration. CPOA tries to bring these concerns to the administration and has done so decade after decade. Some challenges, defeats, and some wins. We have dealt with a, a lot over 60 years. The escalating taxes, it worked to convince local government to consolidate the school districts and it eventually helped to moderate the school tax. And the annual property assessments, they're less frequent. In the 90s, we saw CPOA publish and distribute um, a Chautauqua service guide and the booklet Living in Chautauqua. Property owner suggestions led to a traffic light on 394, in yellow shirts on bicycles, both improving safety. We started selling bike lights at cost down at the club and hosting bike rodeos. Up until the pandemic, when the colonnade closed, the CPUA board meetings were held in the colonnade went boardroom. President Bratton, McVeigh, and Becker, during their various tenures, all sat in to give brief statements on gate ticket numbers or management issues. For many years, the Community Relations and Operations Officer, Charlie Hines, attended our meetings, every single one of them. The accessibility that we had with these administrators set up the expectation that we would continue to always have that access to their insights and listening. Two decades ago, we worked with the institution to set up affordable housing task force, while the CPOA continued to work on an interfaith housing task force. 
An accomplishment of coordinating the institution and the utility companies was amazingly carried out by CPUA over the last 10 years, switching out all the lighting fixtures on our streets and walkways as a part of the Dark Sky Lighting Initiative. This massive volunteer project led to better illumination of our streets along with reducing the cost of electricity. It's also more environmentally friendly too. Remember the old tin pan lights, they're gone. The community strengthening over years include picnics, welcome back dinner, a funded dog park, hosting informative local spe speakers, from lake health to recycling, not to forget the shared space initiative. I found out CPA was responsible for even raising the age limit for minor gate pass to age 25, just so our college kids can have more affordable, uh, can be more affordably be here with us. Um, property owners also have a website that's a great resource to, to residents. I could go on and on but our imprint seems to be everywhere. Pride in owning a piece of Chautauqua and being a part of this unique community is the focus of CPOA. There have been various organizations of cottage owners that existed before us, but never lasting more than a few years. Through belief in our mission and all of your support, we hope to go strong another 60 years. If you have any questions, that's a cool, we just, we just put that up because we like that. <laughs> that's like really, really old. It says, views on assembly grounds. Yeah, but these things all really happened with this evolution of uh, being, living here and being a part of Chautauqua. And um, I want to hear any comments, questions you have. Um, I can try to answer them. And thank you all for coming. Yes, go ahead. Over what period of time did all of the construction take place, and what was the process for um, permitting and design? They used, uh, I would say, I want to say 1920, in the 1920s, like 1921, 1920 through 26. Think of Vester Plaza. Um, that's when the colonnade was rebuilt. The, uh, there was some, uh, uh, some buildings that they actually had removed that were uh, made of wood. Um, but they built the post office and the library, um, and they used an uh, architect from Buffalo, and uh, they actually had a whole grid pattern laid out and designed for, that was done actually earlier, during the assembly, they laid, it, laid out all the, the streets and parks, and, um, but when you talk about construction, do you mean any other type of? The individual houses. Uh, the houses? The houses uh, were mostly built um, it around, started around Miller Park. Um, you know, there was a big fire in 1873 that destroyed 50 homes around Miller Park. So some of the ones that are still surviving, it's amazing that they're there. But otherwise, the, the homes were built um, between 1876 and uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1889, 1890, most of the homes that are surrounding um, Miller Park and Simpson going up to uh, Bester Plaza and around there. But uh, if you have, for example, if you have a house that has a little old sink in it, in, I don't know, there, many of the rooms had little tiny corner sinks put in them. And that was during the, the 1920s when they said there was not enough, there's not enough, we're burgeoning, we're growing, we're growing. And, and so there was a request in the 20s and 30s to finally um, have rent out rooms for your, your uh, house. But otherwise, the main old part of Chautauqua was really just built between 1870. 
6 and um, 1903, right there. And then on the ends, uh, it was much, much later it was built. So it must have been like a total construction zone. It was. It was. And, and after that fire, the fire was in March of 18... Um, 18, I said 1873, no, 1870, well, it was anyway in the 1870s, that fire, and I think it was 1876. Anyway, that spring, all those houses were rebuilt. It was a huge rebuilding that went on that spring. So many of the homes were built in 18, um, right when the, the, the hotel was built, 1881. Many of the homes were built around it, and uh, there were some interesting stories about where all these people would eat, for example. Uh, they had kitchens set up all over, including like the, the log cabin over here, behind here, there was a kitchen. Um, I found menus that they put out in the 1880s. Um, but yeah, things were built rapid fire around here, but they were building right on tent platforms and uh, they had already the grid for your lot. You knew what you you knew your lot size. It was small. And it, it was uh, you know, it was very interesting. But you know what if a lot of people got here, they literally would just came on the, the um, trolleys, which were later. But earlier on, it was Julie, just the steamships. Yeah, people came in. Yes? Yeah, I, I was told that uh, Jews were not allowed to own property until the mid-70s. I was wondering if that's true. Yes. And were there restrictions on any other religious or ethnic groups? Yes, and uh, is that an answer? My parents bought the Cary Hotel in 1971, and they were Catholic. And we were not allowed to buy it by ourselves, so my father bought it with another lady who was Presbyterian, and that was how we were. Uh, yeah. Story. Yeah. Now, Jews, uh, there, there was a, you know, a, a board member. I think his name was Faust. Um, he was wooed by the board. He, had, I guess, they had some. He had some talents that the board really needed, but he was Jewish. He was the first. Uh, family, uh, he brought his family here and he was allowed to buy a home in 1972. And then, then Jews were allowed after that. And after that, Catholics. And uh, yes, there was, uh, if you had black help, they stayed at a boarding house uh, specifically for them, the Phyllis Wheatley House. Um, any other questions? The 1936 when the things changed with the board and all. There's a relationship today between the property owners and the board. Is that going on? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We're talking about the relationship between the property owners and the board. Is that running smoothly or is, <laughs> is that running smoothly? No. 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 <coughs> like that's our, our whole history. Yes, it is. It is our whole history, and I think. The, um, you know, change is tough. And most of the things I've read over time with the change here has to do with funding and money. And things have really dipped. I mean, we almost lost Chautauqua, literally down to the last day almost, um, where we would, that was during the Depression. And we had to raise money. They had to even secretly raise the last three hundred thousand dollars because they, the, the institution, had to. They could not tell all the property owners that they had Mrs. Pennybacker, who. It was only fifteen thousand dollars. My great grandfather was Oh, wonderful! And I know that story. Yes. Yes. An amount of money, and they were tapping into what had not been spent uh, until that point. But 
Yes, it did go the, down to the wire. It did. And, and this at is, point, yes. The Board of Trustees was not running the institution. The um, uh, recovery uh, yes. group was running it. And they told Dr. Bester how much money he had every year to play in the program. Right. And turned that then into the Chautauqua Foundation. Yes. Thank you. And so we've had our, our uh, financial side of Chautauqua has been separated ever since from the institution of actual board. Yes? The docks were also part of the uh, 1930s to rescue during the Depression. That's how the docks came. Uh, people got together and bought the dock rights as groups. Push money in. And push money in uh, by buying docks uh, uh, on the waterfront. You know, um, I, I read uh, an interesting article too in the files on about Bill Carslake was the head of waterfront committee. Waterfront committee. This is, I don't know, 70s? I, I don't, I'm not sure when this happened. But the waterfront was in poor condition and people were not happy with that. But what I liked about what I read was Bill Carslake put a letter out, it's in our file, to all community members that said, we need your help. I want your input on how you foresee this waterfront, what it should look like, how we should be allowed to access it, who should own the docks, who should, have, where should our public docks be? And so there were times when um, I was uh, pretty impressed with the kind of feedback people jumped into, again, community, property owners, people were Chautauquans, uh, maybe they didn't own anything, but they had a season pass and they had a, a boat here. They, they all had a chance for input in how it was shaped. And I, I think that as far as the current situation, we, we have to work on it. There's, there's something that we could be doing, probably more so, in the area of communication and the ability to have input. Um, there was a time when uh, the Board of Trustees had community meetings, I mean, sorry, community members, community member groups that would advise each uh, committee. And so it just says, it's just that a lot of this just sort of waxed and waned, you know, with the years, depending on the administration, it depended on uh, who's who is uh, board uh, to trust uh, who is the chair of the trustees and who was president and how it uh, you know evolved. So yeah. Well, uh, it just seems that you only have a very small number of property owners trustees. I mean, they they can sort of blow you off if they want to. If that's what's going on or not. I don't you know, he's concerned about this, the low number of trustees that are property owner trustees, which is four out of the 24. One of the things to remember, again, historically, those were, I couldn't tell, I had a list, I have an ongoing list of all of the um, members on the board who were Class B members who were chair of committees or who were on the executive board. They had a lot of power and say. They were head of buildings and grounds. Um, they were head of, of all kinds of committees on the board of trustees. They were the, in the executive board. So it just depends on how our voices are heard. And when we, we shared a space at the colonnade, uh, those years CPOA met there and probably felt their voices were heard. But there, if we go back to like 1920 or 1931, um, you know, there's a, there's a letter that went out that, that said that uh, we have to gather at Hurlbut Church we community owners because we have to do something about Chautauqua. It's not being financially managed well, and we need to stand up and say something. But 
I couldn't find anything else that I couldn't find another letter um, as to what happened. But you, they were disgruntled then, and things had to change. The the um, committee meeting. I mean, let's see, it was the um, the committee that uh, the liaison committee from 1974 to 1979. They were quite powerful. It had two. Um, it had four people on it. Two were CPOA executives and two were uh, Class B trustee officers. And they were allowed to work with directly with the administration. And in the fall of 1974, or 76, they sent a letter to the head administrator and said, we want these things done. We, as a community, have a list of concerns and issues. So I brought that list with me here today, if you want to take a look, and believe me, um, that just said, if we don't get these things improve, improvements made on the grounds, then we are going to have a problem here. And um, they used the name, you know, like George Hollinsby was one of the people involved. Um, but what happened it was that this uh, administrator, he resigned. So by, by November, he, did, he resigned because he couldn't, we don't know, I don't know, it doesn't really say, but obviously couldn't meet the needs on that list of concerns. So they hired a new person um, in January and a new administrator head, and they were able to accomplish most of what was on the list, but not everything, because that administrator would say, it's not possible and we don't have the money. And uh, so there was, there was a lot that was truly accomplished in the past as far as our um, influ influence on the board or with our administrators, but it was more accessible. So that's something we have to think about is how when we maximally can be accessible and they can tap into the, the wisdom that we all have, you know. And if you have, again, if you have good ideas and you know some people who, who contribute some suggestions, you know, let us know on CPOA or, yes, go ahead. Um, forgive me. First of all, thank you so much. I think it was great what you did the welcome dinner. It was great. So oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, all your efforts. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I just want to clarify. Um, class B trustees, those are the ones that have CPOA lists, right? We have four. Well, the CPOA does not elect them. The corporation elects them, and the corporation is made up of the property owners. Not all property owners are members of the CPOA. It's a completely separate process. Okay. But, okay, so there's four that we contribute to nominate, and then they get, right? No, there, there's four that are elected by the corporation. That's really the end of the story. The CPOA every year nominates a, a candidate because we do a lot of work in the community and we, we identify somebody that we think would be represent the property owner as well. But other people run and the corporation, which are the people that own the homes, vote. And that is run by the institution. It's a corporation process and it has absolutely nothing to do with the CPOA. But it has a lot to do with democracy. So if you are able to register to vote, get out and vote. You have usually more than one choice. But, well, the other part of the yep. okay, so those are usually property owners, right? Less people. Yes, they have to be. They have to be. Okay, that's four of the 20. Correct. And of the, of the 20, that are the other 20, they don't have to be property owners at all. There's no A lot of them are, but I, I don't no believe that is a requirement. The, the majority has to be. The majority by, unless they change their bylaw. But the bylaw that was granted and changed in 1936 was specifically that the majority of trustees, those other 20 trustees, have, they have to be homeowners. And the majority of trustees presently are homeowners. They are. They are. Yes. 
Any other questions? Yes, Lynn. At the time, in 1900 and 1901, that's when they were um, discussing here on the grounds or in Cleveland, changing to uh, an, a, a board of trustees that could be self-elected. And uh, there was certainly dispute. So I have an article over here, it was, it's not in the newspaper, it's something that was just stuck in our file, an original copy. That's about, um, let's see, led by a man by the name of Pickard. He said, I will lead the cottagers to fight this tooth and nail. I am not going to accept the fact that we cannot continue to sell, to, to elect our, our trustees. We will not be Remove to four, four uh, choices. That's it. So he he led a lawsuit between the the uh, Vincent and Miller group, their attorneys, and they either withdrew or they lost. I'm not sure. It's it's a lot of complex legal legalese, but there were people who did fight it becoming. Um, revised in, in the, as far as the charter goes. And I don't know why, why did they pick four? Why couldn't they pick six? I don't know. <laughs> yes. But Joanna, to follow up on that, I don't know the answer to this. If it's part of the charter, and that's filed with New York State. It is? I think. Yes. It is filed with New York State. It's a very complicated thing. It has been looked at multiple times by multiple people as to its legal standing, and it stands. But the language in the uh, letters in 1901 said it's as illegal as can be. It is illegal. And it was just a debate, that's all. I had to go, and it, because it's filed with New York State, it is law that we have it. Way it is. Yes. I have a different sort of question, but I'm curious uh, about the number of houses that might be winterized. Is there a full time, full year population in Chautauqua, or is it just truly summer only? There is a percent of who, who live here year round. Okay. Absolutely. So houses are winterized. Houses are winterized, yes. Not all of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are summer, well, a lot of these are summer houses, not winterized. and. I don't know. Does anyone know how many people live here year round? 150 to 200. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, uh, and hopefully, I hear it's growing. I really do. Um, any other questions I can help you with or show you materials? Uh, yes, right. Yes. We were trying to find that out, actually. Yes? Well, I know when I was on the, I was a CPOA, well, uh, yeah, trustee for on the board of trustees for a CPOA. Yeah, class B trustee. Class B trustee. And, um, I can't remember the name of you. Um, Joanna had worked together. Around 2000, I would want to say you, around 2004, to, Four. Uh -huh. 2004 mm -hmm. for eight years, but I had to sign it. But prior to that, it was somewhere around 2000 that it changed. I was active on CPOA, and it, it just, I can't really pin it down, but our uh, Class B trustees attended all of the CPOA meetings, and they shared with us a meeting, um, a report of whatever they proceeded uh, at their uh, trustee meetings until one meeting 
when they said, I have nothing to share. We cannot, there's nothing to share. We what cannot that? say that. It was, it just it seemed like it was like 2001, 2002, something in the late, right about that time. Because I, I went on, I was active like 1997 to uh, 2006. Yeah. But they are back to reporting to us. That. Yes. So in the last sort of six months or so, the, the institution is putting out reports, and um, the Candy Maxwell. I don't know if you got those emails. She she did a summary of the last trustee meeting, and our class B trustees attended the CPOA board meeting and gave a, a very detailed report. So let's I come back that, around. Yeah, I I remember reporting them. I mean, we we could talk about what went on, and you know, I mean, yeah, I remember reporting. To, mm -hmm. to the well, it might have been like a, a sort of general things that we could all be, you know, listen to. But there was quite a lot of policies and yeah. decision making that we certainly were not shared. But in answer to your, yeah. what you were talking, what your question was, um, I feel that that the class B trustees felt that they didn't have any say. You know, we were kind of shut down. I could go back to the very Carl Brown days, you know, and we felt that we did not really have a voice and were we really important or not. But there but there were a lot of things we did that we got through that were good too. But I think I think a lot of us felt that way. You know, yeah. I hate to say that, but we did. Yeah, so Jennifer's just saying that she didn't feel like she had a voice as much as a class B trustee during the time that she was on for how many years? Eight. Eight years. Yeah. Now well, it was a wider. Yeah. Well, we did, and we did. Well, it was the time when the amp, you know, they were redoing the redoing the amp, amp and the Winsley House. And I can remember my favorite story being in a meeting. They wanted us to vote on, you know, renovating the amp and the Winsley House. You know, they're calling for a vote, and I'm thinking, I've never been in the Winsley House, and I'm voting on it, and I've never been upstairs of the amp. So I raised my hand and I said, I'd really like to see these places that I'm voting on to give all this money to see if we really need renovations. So we came back at lunch and they took us on a tour. So I did feel that time we were, you know, that um, they did listen to somebody. But and afterwards, I will tell you that once you saw it, it was 100% yes, because the ceiling was caving in, it was dangerous. Um, I know there was a lot of dissension at that time, but it was Really, really yeah. uh, you know, that's just one of the stories. Well, anybody, anyone else? Did you want to well, introduce just, yourself? Well, since we're on the topic of class B trustee, uh, my name is Michelle Abelman, and it was just recently announced that I'm the CPOA's nominee for class B trustee. So, just wanted to put a face and a name together. You guys have seen my bio. Um, I will be out and about trying to meet folks. I'll be trying to get all of the CPOA picnics, and I'm going to have a little meet and greet on Buster Plaza, but watch the Chautauqua Grapevine and other things um, so you can see where to find me. And my first priority is really to hear from the property owners, so please do find me out. I'm kind of distinctive with a little short hair. I'm always wearing something bright because I expunged all the black from my hair sitting over there. <laughs> so you should find me wearing something quite bright, but uh, just to put a face with the name. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it.